Welcome to the first video in a series intended to walk you through the basics of flying the Airbus A320. In this video series, we will set up and fly a flight from Portland to Las Vegas at the A320 and, through this flight, teach you the basic procedures and flows to fly the A320. First off, this flight will be flown using generic Airbus procedures as much as possible, with some hints and tips thrown in along the way. However, it is important to realize that every real-world operator runs the A320 with slightly different procedure variations to suit their particular operation. This usually doesn't change the actual procedures, but often changes the order or adds small details specific to each company. If you are studying for a type rating, please keep in mind this information is generic and refer to your company procedures for detailed information. Secondly, the Airbus is an incredibly complex machine. The complete flight crew operating manual is over 6,000 pages and includes lots of additional details and special procedures for different situations. I will try to cover information in this series to get you set up and flying a basic flight in the A320, but there is so much more information available to cover different situations. So this video series will only be the start of your learning about the Airbus and not the end. In this video, we are going to cover the very initial setup of the aircraft. Some of these steps may not be required depending upon the state you find the aircraft in. If you walk onto a cold and dark airplane with no electrical power established, we must perform two procedures, the configuration safety procedure followed by establishing electrical power. If there is already power on the airplane from the APU or external power, we can skip to the preliminary flight deck setup. The configuration safety procedure may be a flow or a checklist. We will check several critical switches to ensure that nothing will start moving or otherwise provide a hazard to nearby personnel when we do apply electrical power to the aircraft. We will perform this as a flow from top to bottom of the flight deck. It should be pretty obvious how any of these switches in the wrong place when we turn on electrical power could be hazardous to people near the aircraft. Windshield wipers. Off. Landing gear lever. Down. Engine Masters 1 and 2, off. Engine Mode Selector, norm. Weather Radar Switch, off. Wind Shear Predictive Wind Shear Switch, off. Gain Mode, auto or cal. Mode Selector, as required. Speed Brake Lever, retracted and disarmed. Flaps, confirm position. Should match the current configuration of the aircraft. Parking Brake, on. Configuration safety is now complete. The aircraft is now safe for the next step, establishing electrical power. Similarly, this may be performed as a checklist or a flow, depending upon company procedure. Battery 1 and 2 push buttons off. This ensures the batteries are not connected to any bus, and the voltage indicator indicates the charge level of the battery, and not the voltage that is trying to charge the battery. Battery 1 and 2 voltage, check above 25.5 volts. This indicates at least a 50% charge of each battery, ensuring they will be able to provide power in flight during an electrical emergency and RAT deployment. If the battery voltage is below 25.5 volts, then a 20 minute charging cycle will be required. Batteries 1 and 2 push buttons, auto. External power push button switch on. External power must be used to charge the batteries in this state. After 20 minutes, we will disconnect the batteries and recheck their voltage as follows. Battery 1 and 2 push buttons, off. Battery 1 and 2 voltage check above 25.5 volts. This would indicate a properly charged battery. If the batteries are still not charged, we can continue to charge them, but must check them again prior to departure. If they never exceed 25.5 volts, they will need to be changed before departure. Battery 1 and 2 push buttons, auto. Now, if the batteries were above 25.5 volts, then we can simply turn them on and establish an AC power source. Ideally, this is usually external power. Battery 1 and 2 push buttons, auto. If external power is available, external power push button switch, on. If external power is not available, the APU must be used to provide an AC power source, preferably sooner than later. After 30 minutes on batteries only, battery power will be down to less than 25% charge in the aircraft. If external power is available and we don't want to start the APU immediately, we can skip the APU fire test and start procedure. 
APU fire test and start procedure. Prior to starting the APU on an airplane that was unpowered, we must test the APU fire detection system. This is important to do now because if we do it later, we can cause an automatic APU shutdown and even trigger the APU fire extinguisher if we run the test for more than three seconds while the APU is already running. APU fire push button switch, check in and guard it. APU agent light, check off. APU fire test button, press and hold. Maximum three seconds if the APU is already running. Check that the APU fire warning appears on the ECAM. The master warning illuminates. You can hear the continuous repetitive chime. And the APU fire push button switch is lighted and the squib and discharge lights are on. Note that if no AC power is available, you will not hear the chime and the APU fire push button switch will only be partially illuminated. If all of these conditions occur, the system is working properly and the APU can be used. APU master push button switch on. Always wait at least three seconds between selecting the APU master and the APU start switch. This allows the APU FADEC to run its full self-test. It will not begin a start cycle before the test is complete. APU start push button on. Once the APU is started, the green avail light will appear on the start switch. If external power is available, external power push button switch as required. It is recommended to continue using external power even with the APU on until close to departure to reduce APU fuel burn and operating temperatures. When the APU is available, APU bleed push button switch on. However, do not use APU bleed if an external air source is connected to the aircraft. Also, it is recommended not to turn on the APU bleed for at least three minutes after the APU start has finished to ensure the APU seals have reached operating temperature and will not leak oil into the air conditioning system. If you encounter an airplane where electrical power is already available, i.e. external power or the APU have been left running, the only procedure prior to preliminary cockpit preparation is to ensure the batteries are turned on. Usually they have been left on with the APU, but turned off if only external power is being used. Batteries 1 and 2, check auto. Now that we have electrical power established, we can perform our preliminary cockpit preparation. This includes several different steps to ensure that the aircraft is ready for an external pre-flight inspection and ready for FMGS programming and flight deck preparation. After power is established, the FMGS runs through a self-test procedure that takes up to three minutes. Do not try to make any entries into the MCDU until all tests are completed. If a please wait message appears, do not make entries until the message clears itself. A logbook check should be performed prior to flight. This involves pressing and holding the recall push button for at least three seconds. This will display all cancelled ECAM messages that appear during the previous flight. Note that this does not work on most flight simulator A320s. The messages that appear should be checked against the logbook entries to ensure that everything has been logged. This is also the time to review the logbook to see if the first flight checks have already been carried out and that the snags in the logbook match the MELs listed on the flight plan. Next, the ADRs should be turned on. Do not delay this step as IRS alignment requires up to 15 minutes and almost no further preparation can be accomplished until the IRSs are properly aligned. All IR mode selectors, NAV. To align the IRS, the airplane must be stopped on the ground. If the aircraft is moved during alignment, the alignment must be restarted. We will initialize some basic flight parameters to help with the IRS initialization using the MCDU. On the MCDU, press the data button and select aircraft status. Confirm the correct aircraft type and engine type and cycling the navigation database will remove all previous flight plan data and user defined waypoints, thus ensuring a blank start to the flight. Always start a flight by cycling the navigation database. Note that this action does not work on flight sim aircraft. Confirm a valid navigation database is loaded. Now press the init button to take us to the init alpha page. Insert the ICAO flight number. Today's flight is AIR123.
Insert the Ikeo City Pair for our flight. For today, it is KPDX Slant KLAS for Portland to Las Vegas. Now we can confirm the IRS alignment position as we have told the computer where we are starting today in Portland, KPDX. IRS Align. At the top are the departure airport coordinates. Confirm these are correct against your navigation chart or your flight plan. Below are the alignment values being used for each IRS. These default GPS coordinates, once the GPS has detected its position and should be very close to our airport coordinates. However, if there is an error or any doubt about the GPS accuracy, press the Align on Ref key to copy the airport coordinates to each IRS and press Confirm Align. Once the IRS is aligning, we can't do much else on the FMGS. Now is a good time to finish the rest of our housekeeping items on the flight deck. We must first verify that eight items of safety equipment are present on the flight deck. For each pilot position, including the jump seat, there will be a life vest. We also need to check for the crash axe, the fire extinguisher, and the protective breathing equipment, which is usually stored in the side storage compartments or attached to the back wall. We also need to check and make sure that each position has oxygen masks available. Check for the presence of the escape ropes above each window. Check for the fire gloves, which are usually kept in a pouch attached to the rear wall. And finally, check for flashlights located by each pilot's knee. We must also confirm that all the required aircraft documents are being carried aboard the aircraft. Check your company manuals to ensure that all items such as checklists, QRHs, company manuals, and certificates of airworthiness and registration are being carried aboard the aircraft. We must also confirm that all circuit breakers on the rear and overhead circuit breaker panel are in. Normally we would also check the operation of the cockpit door, but we will not detail that in this video. Finally, prior to conducting the exterior pre-flight inspection, there are a couple of items we must check to ensure that everything is in a suitable position to conduct the pre-flight inspection. Nav and logo switch on so that the nav lights can be checked during the exterior inspection. Parking brake handle on so that we can check the brake wear pins. The pins must protrude from the brake housing when the parking brake is on. Oxygen pressure. Oxygen pressure is checked on the doors page. If regulator low pressure appears, we've probably forgotten to turn on the oxygen on the overhead panel. Turn on the crew oxygen supply and recheck the door oxygen SD page. The cockpit oxygen should be in the green. If a half amber box appears around the cockpit oxygen quantity, then the quantity may not be sufficient for flight if all the flight deck seats are occupied. The limitations section of the FCOM should be consulted to determine the exact value required depending upon the number of crew members on board. Next, check the hydraulic reservoir fluid level on the hydraulic SD page. The normal range is the green band on the indicator. As long as the arrow is within the green band, then the hydraulic system is suitable for flight. It is possible to be slightly outside of the range depending on outside air temperature, but if in doubt, contact maintenance to have the quantity confirmed. Finally, we must check the engine oil quantity is sufficient for the flight. The limitation section requires that we have 9.5 quarts plus an extra 0.5 quarts for every hour of expected flight time. Today's flight time is about one and a half hours, so if we round that up to two, we should have nine and a half quarts plus one extra quart, or ten and a half quarts is the minimum for departure for this flight. Lastly, we will perform a preliminary performance calculation for takeoff. This may be done on your tablet or using a third-party system. So I will not spend much time explaining it here. But among the items we must consider, make sure your weight is realistic and the runway conditions are accurate. You also need to determine if flex, packs, and anti-ice will be used. For the weight, it is better to overestimate the weight as this gives you some leeway if your final weight changes. Note that flex takeoffs cannot be selected if a runway is contaminated, that is, its 
not wet or dry, but has some other kind of contaminant on it besides just wet or dry. Flex can also not be used if there is any wind shear reported on departure, or if it has been prohibited by an MEL or the route manual. Packs cannot be used if a runway is contaminated, and it is also advisable to use a PAX off departure in the A321 when the temperatures are above 15 degrees Celsius, as the larger engines are prone to EGT over temperature. Anti-ice for the engines is required for departures in visible moisture, including a wet runway, when the temperature is below 10 degrees Celsius. Wow, that was a lot. We are now ready to start getting this Airbus ready for flight. Preparing for flight is not a short process in the Airbus, but rest assured you will have the safest flight possible when you follow all the procedures correctly. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.